All right, welcome and happy new year, everybody. Uh, this is the first talk of 2023 in Turkish Med Society's monthly distinguished colloquium series. It's a real pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Larry Good, uh, who is a Claude Shannon professor of mathematics at MIT. Um, he obtained his PhD from MIT in 2005 under the supervision of Thomas Smorovka. Um, Larry has major contributions in multiple areas of mathematics, including improvements on Gromov's systolic inequality in metric geometry, on which he gave an ICM talk in 2010. With uh, NetScats, the resolution of Erdős distinct distances conjecture on the plane, which was a major open problem in geometric combinatorics. And somehow more recently with Burgen and Demeter contributions to L2 decoupling theory in Fourier analysis and as an application, the complete resolution of Minagodov's mean value conjecture from analytic number theory. Uh, and he gave a plenary address at ICM, ICM 22 on this topic. Uh, Larry's contributions were also recognized by multiple awards, including Bosher, Mirza Khani and Salem prizes and he's an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences. So uh, without any further delay, the title of the talk today is Introduction to Decoupling in Fourier Analysis. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. Um, so decoupling, as I'll tell you about, is it, uh, there was a breakthrough by Jean Bergan and Cyprian Demeter about eight years ago. And it came as like a real shock to me when their paper came out. First of all, they proved some very strong things that I was, I was, you know, it had seemed quite out of reach and that I thought were very interesting. Um, and then on top of that, I was surprised by how the proofs looked because uh, the, we'll, we'll see the tools that go into the proofs actually are pretty elementary. And I didn't think it was possible to prove these kinds of strong results with, with such elementary tools. And then, but then at the same time that the tools were pretty elementary, um, the details of the proof were hard to follow. There, where there's a, um, a lot of long equations and there's a lot of induction. And so I, you know, when I was first studying it, I felt like I kind of checked every step, but then at the end, I didn't have a good sense of why the theorem was true. Um, so I've spent a lot of time in the last eight years studying this uh, method um, and trying to explain it different ways, look at it different ways, um, and in the last few years, try to explain it to a broad audience. So that's what I'd like to do today is to try to share to a, a broad audience some of the idea of this, of, of, of this method. Um, okay. oh, and, I, and I wanna say, I really, I, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a colloquium and I really hope that it will be accessible to a broad audience. Um, and so I encourage you to let me know anytime if you have questions or comments um, you can put them in the chat or you can just unmute and ask questions um, and, uh, and, and we'll talk together. Okay. Um, so, okay. So of course I'm going to tell you about what is decoupling, but actually I want to start before that. I'm going to talk, I'd like to review with everybody what is Fourier analysis. Uh, okay. So you might've learned as Fourier analysis is the field where we write a function in this form as a sum of some Fourier coefficients times complex exponentials that have different frequencies. Um, why do we do that? Well, we do it because these building block functions uh, have nice properties. Um, the building blocks behave nicely when we differentiate them. Um, when you differentiate this function, then it just gets multiplied by a constant factor. And they, they also behave nicely when you translate them. If you translate the function e to the two pi i and x, uh, it again gets just multiplied by a constant factor. So a fancier way of saying it is that these functions are the eigenfunctions of the linear operator differentiation and also of the linear operator translation. Okay, and th because of that, many problems that involve derivatives that or that involve translation structure naturally connect with Fourier analysis. So that's why it's a good idea to write functions this way, but it also comes with some um, problems. So a uh, problem is, one of the problems is that this representation is kind of awkward and unwieldy. So suppose I'd like to know f of two. Well, I have to plug in x equals two here and sum up many terms, maybe infinitely many terms. 
And um, these terms don't have any definite sign. They're, well, they're complex numbers, but if, say, I look at the real part, they could, they could be po sometimes positive and sometimes negative. And there are so many positive contributions and many negative contributions. I look at this sum, it's hard to tell if f of two is positive or negative. It's hard to tell if it's big or small. Um, and um, and there, there, we'll see in a little bit, there are deep open problems about, about that. Um, okay. So decoupling is uh, a recently developed set of tools that helps to transfer some information about f hat into some information about f. Um, so, so going back to this problem, you know, even if we have a good understanding of f hat and we have like a nice concrete short formula for f hat, it can be hard based on that to describe the function f uh, or vice versa. Um, and decoupling is a tool that helps to transfer information about f hat into information about f. It led to the solution of several longstanding problems in harmonic analysis, in PDE, and in analytic number theory. It was introduced by Tom Wolfe in 2000 in the context of a problem in harmonic analysis and PDE. Um, and, um, it's, and so he had a, a real insight to ask the, well, to, to, to set up the question in the right, in a nice way. And then there was a breakthrough by Bergan and Demeter in 2014, which, which I'll try to describe to you. Okay, so my plan for the day is to first introduce one old problem which has been solved using decoupling, and then to talk through some of the ideas of the proof, and, and, um, and really to spend some time on this, uh, on, on how, not every detail, but on, on, on how the proof works. Uh, okay, there are actually a number of old problems in different fields which decoupling has solved, but I picked just one to explain in, in slowly and in detail. Um, and the problem I'm going to explain comes from a connection between Fourier analysis and Diophantine equations. So it's connected to what's called the circle method um, in Fourier analysis. Okay, so in the circle method, we can sometimes encode the number of solutions of a Diophantine equation using Fourier analysis. And here's a sample problem. This is an old problem that was raised by Hardy and Littlewood. So, um, so we're gonna look at the number of integer solutions of a Diophantine equation. The Diophantine equation is the, and we have two S variables and the sum of the kth powers of the first S variables is the same as the sum of the kth powers of the second S variables. Okay, and each of these variables are integers, so the Diophantine equation, and they run over a range from one to capital N. We ask how many solutions does that have? When we call the number of solutions, HL sub SK of N. HL stands for Hardy and Littlewood who asked this question. And we'd like to understand the asymptotics. So we say we fix S and K, and then as N gets really big, what is the asymptotics of the number of solutions of this thing? Okay, um, and that's related to Fourier analysis. Um, so the number of, that number of solutions can be encoded using Fourier analysis. And here's how it works. Um, it's helpful to have this notation e of x is e to the two pi i x. And then I make a function h of x, which I define by writing down its Fourier series. And its Fourier series is a sum of e of n to the kx. So the frequencies are the kth powers n to the k. And when little n goes from one to capital N, that's my function. And then people observed that the integral of the norm of this function to the power 2s is this number of integer solutions. Okay. Um, so on the next slide, I'm gonna sketch the proof why, why this integral is equal to this number of integer solutions. Okay, so here's how the, here's how the proof goes. Um, this proof kind of illustrates the way that um, uh, the setup of Fourier analysis plays nicely with problems about addition. Um, here's the addition structure of the real line is being used here. Okay, so a basic observation is that if m is an integer and I integrate e of mx from zero to one, and remember that means e to the two pi i mx, um, then if m is zero, I get one, but if m is a non-zero integer, I get zero. Okay, so now remember that h of x is this Fourier series. Um, and um, 
what we're going to do is we're going to take that integral, integral of norm of h to the 2s, and expand it out. And we'll get many integrals of this kind with different frequencies m. And we'll plug this in and see what's left. OK, so if we take the norm of h to the 2s, that's h to the s times h bar to the s. And, uh, and so, so eight for h to the s, we take this thing to the s, so we get s different copies of this of, of the variable n, n1 up to ns. And then the same for h bar, which gives us another s variables. Um, and when we multiply it all out, we get e to e to this power here. Um, OK. Um, and then, then for each of these integrals, if that magical power in orange is 0, then we, this contributes 1 to our sum. And if this magical power is not 0, then this integral is nothing. So, um, so when we add this all up, we get the number of integer solutions where, where that power is 0, which is this Diophantine equation. OK. Um, so let's look at that, at that proposition again. We can write the number of integer solutions of this equation as an integral of a function to the power 2s, where the function is given by a very nice Fourier series. And if I could describe in a really nice way what this function looked like as a function of x, then I could approximate this integral, and it would tell me how many integer solutions there, there are. Um, However, it's not, it's not that easy to do that. And it, it's, I would say it's not even that clear from what we've said so far that we have um, made any progress in rewriting this problem in this way. And it's an example of the problem that I mentioned earlier that it's, it's difficult to go from information about the Fourier series of some function to really understand what the function looks like so I can do things like approximate its integral to some power. Okay. Um, let me tell you what's known about this problem. So, um, so the problem, remember, is that we fix some s and some k, and then as our range of, uh, of our variables, capital N, gets big, try to understand asymptotically how many solutions there are. OK, this is um, pretty well understood in a couple of cases. One case is when the power is 2, which is classical, and there are some kind of algebra tricks. And the other case is when s the number of variables on each side is much bigger than k. And that was done by Hardy Littlewood and Bruno Gradoff and Bois and some other people. But outside of this regime, uh, it's actually not well understood how many integer solutions this has. So for example, if k is three and s is three, then it's poorly understood how many solutions this has. And there are many other tuples, s and k, where it's poorly understood also. So this number of solutions is, as we've said, the integral of this function to the power 2s. And the function has a really nice Fourier series. But even though we have a really simple uh, to write down expression for the Fourier series, it's hard to convert it into accurate information about this function. And here are two explicit open problems that have been open for 100 years. Um, estimate the magnitude of this function at some particular point, like square root of 2. Um, and so the reason I put here square root of two is that if you put a rational number, that it is actually well understood the magnitude of the of the function. If you put a rational number with a small denominator like a half, um, uh, so but if you put a, a a more complicated number like square root of two or pi or or a, you know, any sort of complicated number, then it's poorly understood. And it's also poorly understood to estimate a moment integral like the integral of the norm to the sixth. This integral is poorly understood, and, and people have been working on it for um, close to 100 years. OK, looks like there's a question in the chat. Uh, hide the window in the bottom right. Let me try to do that. Uh, I can see the window in the bottom right. How do I tell Zoom I don't want it anymore? Okay, well, I'll just pay attention to it. And if, if I hide some words, then, um, then I'll, I'll tell you what they are. Thanks. 
Okay. Um, okay. So, so now I'm going to tell you about uh, another Diophantine system that Wiener Gradoff introduced in the 1930s, and I'll explain afterwards a little bit why. Um, so, and he looked at a system of Diophantine equations. So, it, instead of having just one equation, there are k equations for some for some choice of k, um, and the k equations each look similar to before. So it says the sum of the jth powers of my first s variables is the same as the sum of the jth powers of the second s variables, not just for one power of j, but for all the powers j in between one and k. So I still have two s variables, but now I have k equations instead of one. And the number of integer solutions of that thing is called j sub s k of n. And um, Vinogradov proved good estimates for that for some k and some s. Um, and he applied them to a number of problems. He applied them to the hardy littlewood problem. He applied them to estimate the Riemann zeta function. Um, and on the next slide, I'm gonna show you one of the results that he got this way. Okay, so I said earlier that we understand the asymptotics of um, this hardy littlewood equation if quote unquote, s is a lot bigger than k. But what does that actually mean if s is a lot bigger than k? Before Wiener-Gradoff, it meant that S was exponentially big in K. S is bigger than two to the K. But uh, Wiener-Gradoff was able to improve that a great deal. So he got it down to S is bigger than polynomial in K. And the polynomial had the form K squared log K. And then um, since Wiener-Gradoff, there have been some further small improvements. Um, and the current world record is K squared over two, basically K squared over two. Okay, so Vinogradov really dramatically improved uh, the understanding of the hardy littlewood equation by looking at the Vinogradov system along the way. And so for the Vinogradov system, he only proved really sharp estimates for some k and s, but the range of k of s was a lot better than the old range of hardy littlewood. And then he was able to leverage this to understand other problems like the hardy littlewood uh, equation. Okay. Um, so Vinogradov proved good estimates for this for some k and s, but in the last decade, mathematicians have proven good estimates systematically for all of the k and all of the s. Um, and that's and and one of the proofs came about via decoupling, um, which is which is the which I'm going to tell you about. Um, I should also mention that that Trevor Woolley did a bunch of great work on this. Um, so. Um, so he, he has a method called efficient congruencing, who is the first person to get rid of this log k here. Um, and using efficient congruencing, he gave a parallel proof of, the, of, of this. Okay. So here's the theorem. Um, for for um, every s and k, there's an uh, upper bound for the number of solutions of the Wiener-Gradoff system. And it has this form. Uh, there are two, there's a, there's a small factor, a constant times n to the epsilon. The n to the epsilon here is, is not sharp, but this upper bound is sharp up to this factor. Um, and then there are two terms here. This term represents some um, obvious solutions, like setting n1 to be equal to ns plus one and n2 to be equal to n to the s plus, ns plus two and so on. Uh, and this term, represents, um, one way to think about it is sort of quasi-random solutions that, um, um, well, this expression here takes only so many values and for each j, and by the pigeonhole principle, you can locate pairs that, different tuples that produce the same values, and that gives you a lower bound on the number of solutions, and and that's, that's that lower bound from the pigeonhole principle. Okay. Um, and, okay, and, and, and it's impressive that it's systematically sharp for all of the Ks and all of the Ss, um, because a similar problem with one variable has been out of reach for a long time. And, and this problem people thought about for a long time before getting a full answer. Um, there are several proofs of this theorem. Um, so Trevor Woolley proved it first for k equals three. K equals two is, is, is classical. Um, and then um, for all k, 
Bergan and Demeter and I gave a proof using this decoupling idea, which I'll, I'll describe to you. And Trevor Woolley gave a proof which is different in a lot of ways using efficient congruency, but there are also some parallels. Um, and, um, and then recently there's been a 10 page proof by Guo, Lee, Jung, and Zoran Kronich. And they built on and combined these ideas and they made, it, they made everything really um, uh, concise and smooth. And, and um, so this is, this is a paper that, it's not an easy 10 pages, but it's basically self-contained and, and anybody, any mathematician in any field, I feel like, if you're willing to take a, take a, a couple of days, you could read this paper. All right. So the goal, my main goal in the talk is to describe some of the ideas of the proof. And now all of the proofs I just showed you involve some complex formulas and computations, which I found a little overwhelming when I was first looking at it. And I will attempt to explain the ingredients of the computations without writing long formulas. I'm gonna focus on the decoupling proof, but some of the things, some of the general um, high level issues and ideas are really apply to all of the proofs. Okay, um, so let's pause and compare these two problems that I mentioned. So the, the Hardy-Littlewood problem is estimating how many integer solutions there are to this one equation, two S variables. And for many values of K and S, this is an open problem. And the Vinogradov problem has a system of equations. Um, and that's now understood at least up to this factor of C epsilon n to the epsilon. So it raises the question, why is the Vinogradov system easier to understand? And roughly the reason is that in the Vinogradov system, it's possible to combine information from different scales of n. In other words, suppose that I gave you as a black box that for, for one particular value capital N, where so that capital N remember is the, the range of each of the variables, so one to capital N. So suppose I tell you that when capital N is a billion, there's a nice bound for the number of solutions of this thing. Um, then you can actually use that in a helpful way to understand um, what happens when capital N is much larger. There's a relationship between the, the different scales and that relationship is not present in the same way when you just look at this equation. And that contributes to making it a lot harder. Um, so this idea of multiple scales was used by Vinogradov in his first work on the Vinogradov system. And it continues to be a central, um, a central idea in all of the different approaches to the problem. Um, okay, and so we'll, we'll see how it comes out in the, in the Fourier analysis. Okay. So what, is it, so what does it have to do with Fourier analysis? Um, well, just like for the Hardy-Littlewood equation, we can write the number of solutions of this thing as the integral of some function. So um, because we have k equations instead of one equation, it's an integral on a k-dimensional cube of some function to the power 2s. And the function has a nice Fourier series, which I'll tell you more about in a little bit. So if you write, you can write down the Fourier series of this function in a very explicit way. And as before, the problem is that based on the Fourier series, we have to describe what the function actually looks like as a function of x. All right. Now, we do not know how to estimate the norm of f of x at each point x in an accurate way. Um, doing that would be at least as hard as understanding the Hardy-Littlewood problem, and, um, and it's, it's been out of reach for a long time. But nevertheless, we do know how to estimate this integral, or more generally, an integral with any power. So this is called the pth moment, and we can estimate the pth moment accurately for any p. All right. Um, so in the decoupling proof, what we're going to do is we're going to estimate this integral, and we're going to do it using purely real analysis methods. There's, there's no number theory in the proof from this moment on. The kind of things that go into this proof are things like orthogonality, Holder's inequality, some elementary geometry. Oh, we'll see what that means. Um, and induction on scales, combining information from many scales. And it's kind of surprising that just these ingredients are enough to prove a sharp estimate for how many integer solutions there are in this system. 
which first of all sounds like it would have to do with number theory. So maybe there should be some subtle number theoretic things that don't are not taken into account by this kind of stuff. And uh, you know, also people tried hard and it was open for, for a fairly long time. Um, the sort of star ingredient or newest ingredient is, uh, is this induction. Maybe I shouldn't say newest because some version of this induction goes back to Vinogradov, um, but it's still true that all the, the improvements in all the recent proofs are heavily based on using this induction in the smartest, cleverest, most efficient way. Um, so one of the goals for the proof is to make clear what that, what that means. What are we doing induction on and how is it helpful? Okay, the third comment is that the decoupling proof is also very visual. Um, so I'm gonna try to draw pictures. And at the beginning, we're gonna choose a coordinate system that makes the pictures nice. Um, to keep the algebra simple and to be able to draw good pictures, we're gonna focus on K equals two, two-dimensional Vinogradov system with two equations. Um, that's actually has a simple old proof, um, but I just use that to illustrate the ideas of the proof that work for, that work for every K. Um, okay. Okay, so, so now let's try to be kind of concrete and write down our exponential sum and the bound that we need to prove about it. So it's going to be two dimensional. So X is going to be a point in R2. And F of X is this exponential sum. So this is a complex exponential and it has a frequency and the frequency is a vector because we're in two dimensions. The vector has first component little n over big N and second component little n squared over big N squared. So those are the frequencies. And notice that this one is that one squared. In other words, these frequencies lie on a parabola. So those are the frequencies. And what we're doing is we're adding up a complex exponential with each one of those frequencies. And that's our function that we're gonna to try to understand. And what are we gonna to try to understand about the function? Um, we're gonna to try to understand it, the integral of the function to some power. Um, okay, so it's, we're gonna integrate it over some square. So Q sub S is a square side length S um, centered at X. And the kind of integral we need to do is uh, integral over some square of the norm of f to the some power. And it, it turns out that six is the crucial power for, for this particular um, exponential sum. And also that the size of the square is n squared. So capital N is the number of terms in this sum and the size of the square where we're gonna do the integral is capital N squared. So if you just sort of translate the original problem uh, about how many solutions there are to the Wiener-Gradov system to dimension two. If you translate into Fourier analysis, like we did with the Hardy-Littlewood system, then this is the integral that you get. Okay. Um, let me pause there and see if the problem is clear. So this, so this hopefully feels like a concrete problem. Okay, so let's try to visualize this function. Um, so we can plug in different values for x, and the easiest one is x equals zero. If you plug in x equals zero, then this whole thing is zero, and e to the zero is one. So every one of these terms is one, and so f of zero is capital N. And that's the biggest it could ever be by the triangle inequality. We have f of x is less than or equal to capital N, uh, because each of these terms has norm one. However, because these functions are orthogonal to each other, f is usually much smaller than n. And um, so one thing you can say rigorously is that the norm of f of x is at most 10 times the square root of n for most of the points x, say in a large square. Um, another thing we can say about this function is that it's n periodic in the x1 variable. If I increase x1 by capital N, then I increase this whole thing by one. And um, E of y 
is the same as e of y plus one. So it's e to the two pi i y plus e to the two pi i y plus one. So this function is, is periodic. Um, and another thing you can say about it is that it's roughly constant on each unit square. The reason for that is that each of these complex exponentials has a frequency of norm around one. So each of these functions is roughly constant on a unit square, um, or maybe square of size one over 100. And so when you add them all up, uh, at least heuristically, you would expect it to be roughly constant on a square of size one over 100. All right. So, um, so we start to try to visualize. Um, we know that the function is really big. It has size capital N at zero. So we put a red dot at zero. And it's really big on a roughly unit square around zero. And then because of the periodicity, it's also really big at these other unit squares where the spacing is capital N. OK, so those are some places where the function is really big. And on the other hand, at a random or typical point in here, uh, the, it's much smaller. It has size or more like square root of capital N. All right. Um, now, we'd like to estimate the, the integral. Uh, so our, we, we want to bound the integral of f to the sixth on our square. Um, but so that's a measure of how big f is. And a related measure that, that I find helpful for visualizing is visualizing the super level sets. So u lambda of f are those points where the norm of f is bigger than lambda. And for any set, we'll write the norm of that set to mean its measure or its area. Um, so a baby version of our bound for this thing is to bound the measure of the set that I've drawn in red, where the norm of f is around n. So rigorously, I'll write it this way. So this is the set where the norm of f is bigger than n over 10. And of course, it's less than n, so it's around n. Um, how big is that set inside this big square, qn squared? Um, and a baby version of our estimate for this is to say that the area here is at most about n, so n to the 1 plus epsilon. Now notice we've already identified a set of area n where f is really big. So this has size at least n given by that red set. And so the theorem is saying that we've found a, actually a good chunk of the set where f is big. The full set where f is big is not much bigger than what we found already. Um, another way to think about it is that, so at each point we're adding up n unit complex numbers and uh, if they all manage to point in more or less the same direction, then when we add them up, it will have norm n, and that will be a red point in this set. Uh, but if they point willy-nilly and cancel each other out a lot, then the sum will be much smaller. So we're trying to locate the places where these are aligned. All right. Uh, OK, so uh, in this slide, I put some the notation that we've used so far that we want to remember. Um, and uh, I think it's a good time to pause. Everybody can look at that and see if you have any questions. And then we'll start talking about how to prove an estimate like this using Fourier analysis. Okay. All right. So what so what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce to you some of the some of the ideas from Fourier analysis that have been applied to this problem. We'll introduce them one at a time, and with each idea, we'll see how good a bound we can prove on this thing, and gradually we'll improve until we have enough ideas to prove this this sharp estimate. And that will then be a pretty good survey of the ideas that go generally into decoupling or into proving the the Vino Gradoff estimate. All right, so the first tool is orthogonality. So these different complex exponentials with different frequencies are orthogonal to each other. Um, they're not only orthogonal on the whole space, R2, but they're orthogonal on each square of side length capital N. 
Um, you can check that by writing down the inner product and integrating it uh, by hand. You know, you multiply one complex exponential by another, you get a complex exponential. You integrate it over a square, you can do it exactly. And um, this set of complex exponentials is exactly orthogonal to each other on each square side length n. Um, and that helps. Using orthogonality, we can say, so here, here's how, why orthogonality helps. So f is a sum n equals 1 to n of this thing. I'm going to call it f sub n for now. And, but each f sub n is just a complex exponential, so it's a really simple function. And then if I want to integrate the norm of f squared over this um, square, qn, um, by orthogonality, that is equal to the sum n equals 1 to n of the integral norm of fn squared. But norm of fn squared is none other than 1. Um, so this side, we can directly compute. And we know that integral. And knowing that integral, we can say, OK, f, can, f cannot be too big at too many places on this square. All right, so based on this computation, we can say that our red set on each square of side length n cannot be any bigger than a constant times n. And so here's our big square, which is where we, the place where we have to try to prove our bound. We divide it into smaller squares of side length n. On each of them, the red set is not too big, constant times n. There are n squared small squares in the big square, so altogether the red set is not bigger than a constant n cubed. And I tried to draw here how this red set where f is, has size n, how it might look given the information we have so far. But later we'll get more information. We'll see it doesn't really look like that. OK. So, so far we have a bound of n cubed. And what we're hoping for a bound of basically n to the 1. So we need more ideas. The second idea is to break this sum into various pieces. So instead of summing all the way from 1 to n, I, we're going to consider what happens when we sub over any interval in here. So if I have an interval contained in 1 up to n, then f sub i of x will be the sum over n in that interval of the, that, of the same complex exponential. And we can take the big interval from 1 to n, and we can partition it into smaller intervals of some smaller length l, which we could choose. And then our whole function would be the sum of the f sub i of x as i varies over this, these smaller intervals. And this turns out to be a crucial idea. All of the proofs about the Vinogradov system involve looking at f sub i for many different i's with many different length scales l. So those are the different scales when we talk about combining information from different scales. We're going to have the scale as the length of the interval i. We're going to have intervals of many different lengths and estimates for those f i's. And we're going to get them to talk to each other. OK. Um, Okay, now there's a simple lemma that says that if x is in our red set, where remember that means that f of x is around n, and we break up f as a sum of pieces of size l, then uh, it must be that f sub i of x is around l for many, a definite fraction of the x. And the proof idea is, um, so suppose, okay, so the proof idea is by the triangle inequality, the norm of f is at most n, and the norm of each f i is at most l. And the number of i's is n divided by l. So we took the numbers from 1 to n and we broke them into intervals of length l. Okay, so what would happen if the norm of f actually was n? The only way that could happen is if the norm of f i of x actually was l for every i. So then if you relax this a little bit, if the norm of f is close to n, the only way that can happen is that the norm of f i is close to l, maybe not for every i, but for most of them. OK. So that raises a question. What can we say about each of these sets, ul over 20 of f i? And then what can we say about how they overlap? Um, so. If, so, so if something like this, maybe this is u of f1, and this is u of f2, and then my red set, uh, 
values. My set, my actual set U has to be somewhere in there. So if I understand the shape of the purple thing and the blue thing and how they overlap with each other, it'll help me to understand the shape of the red. And that's gonna be our, our general strategy. We'll think about the shapes of all these different things for all different eyes, how big they are and how they intersect with each other. Um, okay, tool three. Each FI has an interesting shape. So if you look at the set of frequencies, um, the, the, uh, you know, we took, a, we took a, all of our frequencies, and then we're going to take just a sequence of them that corresponds to an interval I. So that sequence lies in a box that I've drawn. In other words, FI hat, the Fourier transform of FI. So FI is written by combining just those frequencies in the red box. And in other words, FI hat is the Fourier transform of FI is supported in this red box. What does that tell us about how the function FI looks in physical space? Okay, let's do a warm up problem. Uh, so suppose that G is a function on the real line and G hat is supported between minus a half and a half. What, what could G look like? And to help us think about that, I drew a couple of functions and um, one of them could be such a G and the other one isn't. And I, so I want you all, I'll tell you in a second, but everybody try to think, which of these functions do you think has the feature that G hat is supported in this interval? Okay, so the answer is that this blue function has g hat supported in negative a half to a half, but the orange function doesn't. The orange function has these really sharp peaks, and the sharp peaks require uh, high frequencies. They require a lot of support in Fourier space to make a sharp peak. Um, and um, that's related to a old theorem in information theory that says that if g hat is supported in minus a half to a half, so the g is called a band limited function. And then G can be recovered if you, the whole function G of X for every X can be recovered if you just tell me G of N for integer Ns. Um, and basically, this isn't a, a proof, the truth is a little more complicated, but basically the way it works is like this. So suppose I knew the value of this blue function at every integer point. Then, uh, in order to find the actual blue function, what I do is I, so I mean, you know, imagine I can just see the purple dots. What I do is I just sort of fit a nice smooth curve to those purple dots. And that will be the actual function. I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but it's basically true. And the orange function here fails that test. Because if I know the orange function only at the integer points, um, there would be no way for me to guess that there should be a peak over there. If I fit it with a smooth thing, I would just get a horizontal line. Um, so heuristically, if g hat is supported, is band limited, if g hat is supported between negative a half and a half, then g doesn't really change that much on each interval of length y. It doesn't do something like this, it just doesn't change that much. Okay. So now, how is that connected to our situation um, here? Well, the support of FI, FI is a function in two dimensions, not one dimension. And the support of FI hat lies in a rectangle as opposed to an interval. But basically there's a similar theory in any dimension for functions whose Fourier transform is restricted to a rectangular box. That's a, a straightforward generalization of the Shannon-Nyquist kind of argument. Um, so here's what it says. Um, uh, so, so it says that there's a tiling of physical space. And if Fi hat is supported on this blue rectangle, then there's this sort of dual tiling, then Fi doesn't change very much, or at least norm of Fi doesn't change very much on each tile of the tiling. So for the classical band limit situation, um, uh, we would have our Fourier space, which would just be R, 
and here's minus a half and a half. And here in X, the tiling is just the unit integer tiling. So these are the tiles. And we were saying that if the Fourier transform of G is supported here, then G doesn't change very much. It's roughly constant on each one of these tiles. And here we have a two-dimensional analog of that. We have a function fi whose Fourier transform lives in that box. And then the norm of fi is approximately constant on each of those tiles. Okay, I think this is the subtlest thing, one of the subtlest things. So let me pause for a moment to see if there are questions. Okay, and there's something about the dimensions of these boxes, but I think it's best not to actually not to worry about that. Um, okay, so let me pause and summarize what we figured out so far. So we're interested in this exponential sum and we want to prove that the set where the function is big has a small area. And the first tool is that these complex exponentials are orthogonal to each other. And we can use that to compute the integral over any smaller square, they're orthogonal to each other on a square of side length n. So on any such square, we can compute the integral of f squared or the integral of fi squared. And we're going to look at fi for many different intervals i. And we noticed that if x is in the uh, if if uh, if x is if f of x is around n, then if f of x is almost as big as possible, then fi of x is also almost as big as possible for every i almost every i. And finally, the norm of fi is roughly constant on each rectangle of a special tiling, and the tiling is dual to i. And so the set where fi is really big is a, has to be a bunch of these tiles, because the size of fi is basically constant on the tiles. So the set where each fi is really big is a union of these special tiles. And we're going to combine all of those tools and see what they tell us about um, fi. Okay. So the first tool, orthogonality, tells us some bound on the set where fi is really big. So inside of each um, smaller square, it has area at most that. But we also know that it's organized into these tiles. And if you compute the dimensions of the tiles, there, they have these dimensions, n to the half by n. And so the area of one tile matches this bound. So if we look at the set where fi is really big, where i, by the way, has this well-chosen length scale n to the half, then we get at most one tile in one rectangular tile in each n square. So it looks something like that. And we can do that not just for this one eye, but we can do that for many eyes. And we'll see how they're related to each other. So I drew what happens for three different eyes. Um, so I1 is in kind of purple. And the set where FI1 is really big is in purple. It has at most one tile in each n square. And the tiles are vertical um, because the direction of these tiles corresponds to the direction of those tiles. So the long direction here is the perpendicular direction here. Same for blue. So here's I2, and blue is the place where f of I2 is really big. It's one tile in each n square. And those tiles point in a slightly different direction because I2 does. And the same for I3 in green, and those tiles again are in a different direction. Okay, and there's a, it's a, a, a beautiful observation from restriction theory from this Part of, from a part of Fourier analysis um, it was built by Eli Stein and John Bergan and other people, um, that these tiles are oriented in different directions and that that's helpful. It helps us because they can't overlap that much. So remember that if f of x is really big, then fi of x is also really big for most of the i's. So let's think about where this set could be in this picture it has to be in places like this, where all of the different FIs are big. And 
things. So if these rectangles are arranged kind of randomly, there isn't any place where all of the FIs are big. So there's nowhere in here where f of x is big. Um, and the worst case is that all of the different rectangles could be coincident. And then there's a, a little red ball here where f potentially could be really big. So the set where f is big is contained in those red balls, which are small. And there's at most one of them in each n square. And this gives a second approach uh, to estimating how big this set is. Okay. And that approach um, gives a bound of n squared instead of n cubed. So it's making a little bit of progress. That approach that I just sketched, I mentioned it comes from um, uh, the area of restriction theory and Fourier analysis. And especially it, it involves the ideas from Wolf and from Bennett, Carberry, and Tapp. And I'll call it the orthogonality transversality argument because those are the two main things that went into it. We used orthogonality to understand that there are not too many um, places where Fi is big and they're organized into these tiles of some color. Um, and then we used transversality, the tiles point in different directions. So there aren't very many places that are in all the tiles. Um, and the set where F is really big has to be um, in these rainbow regions that are in every tile. Okay, so that got us to N, just orthogonality was n cubed, orthogonality plus this geometric transversality idea is n squared. And that was the best estimate in harmonic analysis before Bourdain and Demeter. And it didn't seem to me or to many people like there was much hope of going below that using harmonic analysis tools. Um, but decoupling adds one more thing and it uses the same tools we talked about at many different scales. So induction on scales. So we talked about some estimates for Fi. Fi is a subsum of our original sum and the, the places where Fi is really big. It, that actually sounds like our original problem. Our original problem was we have this whole sum F and we want to talk about where F is really big. And in fact, uh, there's even a change of variables that this is equivalent to our original problem. So using all the tools that we already have, we can get an estimate for this set, which is better than just using orthogonality. Right? So if we rewind for a second, just using orthogonality, when we tried to measure how big is the set where F is really big, we got N cubed. But then we added some geometry and we improved it. Well, similarly, if we think about how big is the set where Fi is really big, well, so far we estimated it just using orthogonality. But by the same token, if we add those geometry ideas, we can improve that estimate. When we improve that estimate, here's what happens to the picture. Um, we know that there's, uh, so this blue set is the set where Fi is really big, here's I. We know that it can organize into these tiles and that there's at most one tile per n square. But in addition to that, using induction or using our methods, we can get a global bound which has some extra information. And it tells us there's not actually a blue thing in, there's not enough area to have a blue tile in every square, but only in a few of them. And that's the moment where we used induction. It gives us extra information about each Fi, and then we can just feed that into the argument that we, that we had already. So if we combine all of the Fi's, uh, then in e for each Fi, there's on there are only tiles in, in a few of the squares. And they could be in different squares, but that would help us. The worst case is that all the tiles are in the same square and they all manage to be coincident, which makes the biggest possible red set. That improves the bound, makes an extra ingredient, goes below n squared. And if you do the algebra and check, that goes all the way down to the sharp exponent of n. And that is a sketch of, um, of the ideas in the proof of decoupling. Um, and you know those those same those those same ingredients are the main ingredients more generally um, to prove you know, Grad off, um, or to prove the other applications of decoupling. Uh, okay, well, thank you for having me. Um, oh, let's stop. Right. <laughs> have some questions. Thank you, lady, for the nice talk.
Um, are there any questions? Um, let me ask you a question then. Um, so when you have all the uh, equations j from one to k in the Vinogradov problem, um, you get a curve in RK and having all the powers gives a value curved object, right? Yeah, that's right. So, so if you drop some of the equations, uh, how much is known? What's the current state? Like say, take the first one or the last one, you will lose curvature, well curvedness, or some of the powers. Yeah, okay, that's a great question. Uh, okay, so the first thing Barack said um, is that if we, if we take um, Wienergradoff, in RK, then f of x is a sum um, n equals one to n of e of omega n x. So these are the frequencies omega n. Um, and frequencies omega n lie on the moment curve, which is the curve t goes to t comma t squared comma t cubed comma t to the k, which is a well-curved curve. Um, okay, so what would happen if we had a system? That, yeah, so, so these exponents that appear here, they are closely related to the Vinogradov system. So you remember that the system said the sum of the first powers of the variables on one side is equal to the same on the other side, the sum of the second powers, the third powers, the kth powers. So these exponents here, you can read off of the system. So what if I had um, a different system where I didn't include all the exponents. So one popular example would be like this, um, n1 to the one plus ns to the one equals ns plus one to the one plus n2s to the one and n1 cubed plus ns cubed equals ns plus one cubed plus n2s cubed. But I, I leave out the power two. So just as an example of one way, I could leave out one of the powers. So that will give me, um, uh, I can set it up as the moment of some function with a nice Fourier series. Um, and then the frequencies omega n will lie on the curve, t goes to t comma t cubed, because one and three are the two exponents that appear here. Okay, so we have this curve here instead of a parabola. Uh, or instead of a moment curve in three dimensions. And then the question is, um, how well do we understand the exponential sum for that occurs here? Um, and how well, we equivalently, how well do we understand the number of solutions of this thing? Okay, so, um, so we do not have a sharp understanding of that. And the issue is, you know, so we're given, we're given an exponential sum with a bunch of frequencies. And the frequencies uh, are visually along this curve. And in the decoupling theorem, the key information about the frequencies just comes from the fact that they are on a curve that looks approximately like this. So you could, for example, make a smooth deformation of the curve and it wouldn't change any of the estimates. And you also could slide the points along the curve a little bit. Um, so, so omega n is exactly n over capital N, little n cubed over capital N cubed, but you could, you could slide them along the curve a little bit um, in, the, in the theorem I was telling you about today. That also wouldn't change the estimates. The key information is just kind of the geometric stuff you can see in my sketch of the curve. But for this problem, as best as we can tell, the key information that we need to use about these frequencies is not just that they're on a curve that looks roughly like that. It's kind of some number theoretic information about exactly where the points are. Information that would break if you made a smooth perturbation of the curve. Um, and so the decoupling method so far doesn't know how to use that information, 
it's maybe not even really clear how to articulate what that what in, what the information is we'd like to use. Um, uh, but that's the difference between this this stuff and this stuff. Um, and okay, so we can use if we, I mean we can use the things we know, and we can treat if we just use decoupling, it treats this thing the same way we treat the parabola, and we get the same estimate for the parabola, um, which is a not trivial estimate for this system, but it's not believed to be the sharp estimate. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, so um, something that seemed to be crucial was that um, F sub i and F sub i could be transformed into or related to F sub L, right? Um, yeah. So what are the class of curves for which this is to be expected to hold? Right, that's right. Yeah, um, okay, let me find the spot. Yeah, okay, so, right. So we have, we have this parabola here and then we have some points on it, but for F sub i, we just take a few of them that lie in that box. And then we're gonna do a linear change of variable in Fourier space. And the linear change of variable takes that box, take, it takes the, this arc of the parabola, maybe let me color that arc blue, and it turns it into the whole parabola, the whole parabola from zero to one. Um, and it's just a linear change of variables. Um, now, so you can write it down, it's not that difficult, um, but approximately what's happening is that we're, we are um, stretching that way by a big number. We'd like to stretch out this rectangle to make a square. So you stretch it that way a lot, and you stretch it that way a little, and the rectangle becomes a square. And the curve inside of it doesn't, if, if you just do that, it doesn't become exactly a parabola, but it becomes a, like a nice smooth curve with curvature around one uh, that looks, it looks as much like a parabola as my, as my sketch does here. Um, and the truth is that that change of variables is good enough to do everything that we do in decoupling. Um, so all that we're really using here is that this is a smooth curve, C3 curve would be enough and that its curvature is around one. And as an analogous statement in higher dimensions. Okay, um, got it. Thanks. Yeah. That, was a that was a question in the chat. Yeah, great. What happens in each tile that is a little bit like hardy littlewood sobolev inequality, which can be used to bound the worst case of stacking up sticks? Is there some relationship? Okay, so I think that Hardy Littlewood Sobolev inequality lets us bound. We have, uh, let's see if I understand the question. So F sub J might be some height that depends on J times the characteristic function of some interval that depends on J. And maybe the interval has length two to the J. And then we're so we're so that so this thing is a picture that looks sort of like a stick with some length um, and then and some height. And then we're stacking them up. Um, so we're going to take F as the sum on J of FJ. And we, when we stack the Hardy Lewitt Sobolev inequality tells us about different norms of F in terms of the norms of FJ. Is that is that uh, Am I reading the question right? Okay. Um, right. Okay, and then what happens inside each square? I think that is a reference to this picture here, 
where inside of each square we have some sticks in different directions and they're being stacked up. And um, there can't be too many places that are in every stick. Um, yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting analogy. Um, there's, a, there's an important feature here that the sticks are angled in different ways. Um, and I think that's, that doesn't exact, doesn't have an analog I know for the hardy litterwood sobolev inequality. Um, yeah, yeah, actually, let me say, there are a lot of places in harmonic analysis where we add up some things that have different dyadic scales. Like in the hardy litterwood sobolev inequality, we would add up um, some intervals or balls that have different um, length scales. Uh, or in littlewood paley theory, we would add up some functions whose Fourier transforms have different orders of magnitude, where the frequencies are in different scales. We want to see what happens. Um, and this is a slightly different regime where we're adding up things that are oriented in different directions. Um, and um, um, Well, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, some of the tools from the more classical stuff is, are, are useful, but also it seems to be a new animal adding up things in different directions. For, for example, there's, um, um, when you consider the level set, hardy litterwood sobolev is also an inequality to estimate the overlap of different direction sticks. Okay, cool. Yeah, maybe, so maybe I just didn't know that. Um, um, yeah, that sounds interesting. I'd be happy to hear about it. Maybe I should say that there are some hard open problems about estimating the overlap of different direction sticks. So if you have um, three dimensional sticks oriented in different directions in three dimensional space, um, and you, you stack them all up, I have just, just two sticks in my hands, so which is not enough to illustrate, but I have uh, you know, thousands of sticks, each pointing in different directions, Possible directions are on the two sphere, and they're and they're um, they can pass through each other, and they can you know accumulate where they overlap. Um, estimating how, how how big is the place where there's a lot of overlap, um, that's an open problem called the Kakea problem, which is not not uh, not well understood, and which is in this area. Uh, and de decoupling didn't help with that actually, but it sort of it sort of went around it that there were these other problems that weren't known to be related to the Kakea problem, but people sort of thought maybe they were as hard as the Kakea problem. And it, it turns out that we, we, you don't need to resolve the Kakea problem to resolve some of these things they did with decoupling. All right, thanks a lot. So any other questions? I was just wondering if there are any known practical applications of decoupling theory. Uh, or in say in engineering or other areas, but yeah. That's a great question. Um, uh -huh. it, it, so I don't know any, and it, it does bother me at night a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's neat to be in an area of Fourier analysis where the broad area does have practical applications uh -huh. um, in, for example, modeling, uh, modeling solutions to partial differential equations. Mm -hmm. um, um, decoupling has this feature that we're mostly ruling out um, uh, um, the possibility of special solutions that did something kind of cool. Um, and um, and well, because we're just sort of ruling things out, it's it, it's. Uh, well, you know, these things, if they did exist, I don't exactly have a practical application, but maybe you could imagine that if there was some um, clever function F, which was well concentrated in Fourier space and well concentrated in physical space, then you could use it to build an interesting gizmo of some kind. Uh, I don't exactly know how to do that, but, but you could sort of imagine that that could be useful for, for, for building something. 
But instead, we have a theorem that says that you know there is no function that has such and such properties in Fourier space and such and such properties in physical space, and it's um, it's harder to see, harder for me to imagine how we could use such a theorem to build something. Thank you. It, it led to new Strickard estimates, at least, right? Uh, it did lead, right? It did lead to new Strickard um, estimates on the Torah. Yes, One can say applications to PDEs and hopefully some real life <laughs> relations through that. Yeah, okay, just a comment. Yes. Um, any other questions? Can I know where to find a recording of this uh, talk? Um, if you search for Turkish Math Society Distinguished Math Colloquium, okay, there are many. Uh, talks in the YouTube. All right, thank you. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you for great talk. And thank you for having uh, me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. Thank you so much. All right, bye. Who uh, is it? <laughs>